so as I reflect back on my sermons, I, I wrestle with this realization that I, there's at least a part where I may have failed you. And that really bothers me because I want to give you as complete and full a picture as I can when we, uh, when we talk and when we wrestle with these scriptures together. And part the, one of the ways that I, I'm afraid that I failed you is that I have not brought in enough voices, enough voices from our history that, uh, that speak to these issues that we're talking about. Voices with, at least in theological circles, very famous names. Uh, so, for example, voices like uh, Calvin. Uh, Calvin's a big Big name in theological circles, and uh, you know, I, I just feel like I haven't done as good a job bringing in that uh, that experience. So here, I, I have a picture um, of uh, there, Calvin. Um, <laughs> So if, you're, if you are unfamiliar with Calvin, uh, Calvin is from the uh, comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. Now Calvin is a six-year-old uh, who has in his brain, Hobbes is an anthropomorphic tiger that goes around with him on adventures. Everyone else sees Hobbes as just a stuffed animal that Calvin brings around. Now the, uh, the reason that, uh, that Calvin can speak to us and help us is because Calvin represents one of the ways that we tend to live, even if we are unaware of it, and that is that we believe that the entire world revolves around us. And if you uh, don't believe that's you, you may want to look at people who live with you, just double check and see, uh, because... The, uh, because Calvin, in, in one of the comic strips, Calvin is talking to Hobbes, and he says, uh, he says I, just, I just want a life free of all pain and trouble, next, next panel, uh, where people just hand me amazing opportunities on a silver platter. Is that too much to ask? And uh, Hobbes, in the third panel, rolls his eyes and walks away and goes, whatever. And in the last panel, Calvin is standing there and shouting out to him saying, you at least can acknowledge that I deserve that for my amazingness, right? <laughs> that this sort of idea that, uh, that you are the gift, you know, the, there is a comic that I love uh, that talks about all the different denominations that have spread out in Christianity, and it's this huge tree that goes down, and right down at the bottom of this corner, there's a little circle, and there's a class of students and the teacher, and the teacher says, right down there, that's us. We finally got it right. Everybody else was wrong, but we finally got it right, and one of the students says, Jesus is so lucky to have of us. <laughs> And the, uh, the idea is we walk around as if everything is about us. Everything, every single thing is filtered through. We are the star of this show, and everybody else plays some variety of role or part in our story, and how lucky they are to be in my story, right? This is one of the ways, uh, this is one of the people who can speak to us and help us to better understand the right and wrong ways to live. But there is a, there's another uh, important person that we need to hear from, and that's uh, Charlie Brown. So, if you have a spectrum here, and on one end of the spectrum you have Calvin, where there's not enough oxygen in the room because he's there, on the other end you have Charlie Brown. Now Charlie Brown is over here, and when Charlie Brown, in, in uh, his cartoons and panels, he is pining after the red-headed girl, right? And in one of them he says, uh, but I know why she's never going to see me. I know why she's never going to sit beside me, is because I'm nothing, and you can't love a nothing. I'm nothing. And you can't love a nothing. That would be over here on the other side, right? I mean, this would be the two spectrums. You have Calvin over here, and you have Charlie Brown over here. But the reality is, both of them are self-centered. Both of them are filtering everything through themselves, either in the positive or in the negative. And one of the, uh, one of the actual, uh, we're funning right now, right? But one of the actual theologians that, that we need to hear from and wrestle from is uh, St. Augustine, who says that all sin, what sin does is it, causes, it warps us, and it causes us to curve in on ourselves. So, where we are walking the straight and narrow path, when sin enters our lives, we become warped and curved, and everything starts filtering back to me. 
It either filters back to me in that, boy, everybody is so, so glad. <laughs> you, you can all applaud. I'm here now. Or it filters back to me in that I am the nothingest nothing ever and everything is horrible. My life has no value and meaning and worth. That, and, and we know people. We have moments where we experience both of these. We have moments where we feel this as clearly and as powerfully as we possibly can, and it is almost overwhelming that we feel these things. That is what sin does, is that it warps us so that we become, we come in on ourselves. Part of why we gather, part of why we come every single week, is because we need to face both of those realities. This is our second week in a series on corporate worship, our, why we gather in this room every week. And part of why we, last week we talked about that when, when lots of Christians especially talk about worship and they start wrestling with worship, what they wrestle with is, should you have an organ or not? Should you wear robes or not? Should you do this or do that? Or should you face the back or face the front? Should it be in Latin or in English? And all of that stuff. And I said to you then, and I'll say to you now, uh, I don't care. Um, I, I mean, I care, but, but that's not a conversation that I think gets us anywhere. Because in John 4, we, when, the, when the woman at the well talks to Jesus and asks, you know, where am I supposed to go to worship? Jesus says, the time is coming. In fact, the time is now here. When the true followers of God will worship in spirit and in truth. And we talked about that's just like Jesus because it's very clear and very vague all at the same time and all mixed together. Because you go, oh yeah, that's good. I like that. I should write that down. And then you think, I don't know what that means. In spirit and in truth. And we talked about in spirit in that we are anchored in Christ. It has to be Christocentric, Christ-centered. We talk, we'll talk more about that next week. It has to be powered and fueled by the Holy Spirit, but it has to be true to who we are. Which means that wherever we are and whoever we are as College Parkway Baptists, we need to worship in that way. Wherever you are and whatever church you come from, if they are authentically being who they are, it will look different. It will be different. They will have a different person up here doing different things. And, and part of what that is, is we are speaking honestly and truthfully about what we understand worship to be and who we understand God to be. And authentic, truth-filled worship speaks to that of who we know God to be. So, if we're not going to talk about whether we should have an organ or whether, you know, you know, bagpipes every Sunday are a good idea or not, which, I mean, come on, right? Right? No. Okay. So... If that's not what we're talking about, then what are we talking about? And how do we, what are we wrestling with? And what we're wrestling with is this idea of why is it we are doing what we're doing? Some of those detail pieces, I believe, work themselves out when you get this question right. If you grew up, uh, if you grew up in the culture where everyone went to church, for whatever reason, everybody went to church. And, and, you know, you can bemoan that that's not the case anymore, but it's clearly not the case anymore. But if you grew up in that culture, the question that you got used to asking people outside, or the question you got used to answering is, why should you come to our church? If culturally you have to go to a church, why should you come to our church? Well, you should come because we've got a great piano player, and you should come because we've got donut holes, and you should come for whatever reason. <laughs> You laugh, like people come for the donut holes. Like it's <laughs> so, but then the, uh, the question now, though, isn't which church should you go to? It's why should I go to church? Because my kids have 47 things they could be doing. I'm busy five days a week. Saturdays are filled with other stuff. This is the only day I have to sleep in. My life is already filled. I am not so empty on Sunday morning that I'm wandering around going, gosh, how could I fill this with something that wants to take a tenth of my money? What could I possibly do, right? <laughs> so we have to wrestle with, why are we here? And why would we invite other people to move out of that sort of struggle? Because life fills in whatever space you give it, right? So if you don't set aside time on Sunday morning to be here, life will <laughs> fill it in. Why should you be here? And my answer, part of my answer of why you should be here, is because we are curved in on ourselves. We either think too highly of ourselves, or we think too lowly of ourselves. And part of what worship does is it straightens us back out. 
Sin curves us in on ourselves. And when we gather for worship, we are reminded of something bigger, something more, something better. And we see ourselves clearly through God's eyes and have an opportunity for God to straighten us back out so that we aren't curved in on ourselves anymore. You can tell people who are living over here in this area because it's a lot of eye language, right? It's a lot of eye language. I, I need this. I want this. And the scary thing is there are church leaders who have this kind of language too. It's all about me. I, look, <laughs> my, uh, my brother served, it's not funny, but it's funny now because he's not here anymore. My brother served at this, um, at this mega church as uh, the, one of the music ministers. So four or 5,000 people on Sunday morning between the three services. But the pastor, as he was talking, so 5,000, you know, like the, the sanctuary held 2,500 people. So there'd be 2,500 people sitting there. If a baby cried or made noise, he couldn't continue the sermon. And he would be like, oh, oh. So they had ushers at the doors. Bouncers, basically, at the doors. <laughs> and if you weren't old enough, like if, if the, and there, listen, I'm not kidding. If, if your kid didn't look old enough, they would strongly encourage that you go into the side room where they put the noisy people. Because if something happened, it would mess him up. And he, you know, I mean, it's one thing, look, stuff happens and you just move on, right? Like you, because you're an adult and you just move on. But what he would do, I was there one of the times because I worked there for a long year. Um, and um, <laughs> he, he would, so, Oh, that, that's not a baby. That's a siren. Someone, there's a baby. There's, I didn't practice that beforehand. That's bad. So imagine like a baby, not a scary siren. And uh, so a baby, and he would be talking, okay, so Jesus, uh, and he'd wait, and he'd do that thing people do like, seriously? And he'd be like, and he'd wait. And so like the poor parent, like, okay. I'm crying. I'm crying. And like, then, then would get the clue when 3,000 people are staring at you, right? And so get up and leave, wait and leave. And the one time I saw it, he went, oh, that's gone now, and continue on. And just, when you are curved in on yourself, it is all about you. It is, a, and, and we can even make worship that way. It's about how much I'm in front. It's about how, it's about singing the songs I want. It's about doing the things I want. It's about having the things I want, or I'm going to throw a tantrum and leave. We are curved in on ourselves when we think it is about us. And part of what worship does is that it forces us, true, honest, spirit and truth worship, forces us to remember and, re and react to the reality that we are part of something bigger and more. Something that happened long before we showed up here at 10 o'clock. Something that will continue on long after 11 and long after we are gone. We get to join in with worship that is already happening, with eternal worship, with worship that God is enjoying and has been enjoying forever. Part of why uh, I had them or asked them to sing How Great Is Our God is because the text or the, the words from How Great Is Our God comes from this psalm, Psalm 104. If you have your Bible, you're invited to open it up and turn and uh, follow along as we read. If you don't, there should be a Bible either underneath your seat or underneath the seat in front if you are interested. It is Psalm, psalm 104. Psalm 104, starting in verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, 
they took flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the fields. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the air nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of his work. And it goes on and on and on on purpose because this is what God does and this is who God is. And when we come to worship, we are blessed to walk into and join in with an eternal service that is already happening. God is in the midst of his glory and all of creation is crying out and celebrating. Celebrating. All of the saints of heaven are in eternal worship, and we get to join in. We aren't the focus or the center. It's not about us. We, in this sense, are nothing. We have the privilege of joining in. Do you understand in that context how silly it sounds to say, I just don't like it when the pastor wears red. It looks bad. <laughs> I can't believe they sang that hymn. Like, can you, see, can you see how silly that is when we are claiming some sort of privilege that belongs to God alone? We are nothing. And for those of us who are turned in on ourselves and believe that we are God's gift to everything, this is the word that we need to hear. We are nothing. And we get to simply join in. But... If we end it there, we're only telling half the story. Because if we are nothing, and we simply get to join in, and that's all there is, then that's not good news. That's pretty bad news, right? I'm feeling pretty good about myself. You're nothing. Okay, thanks. You know? We have to start with this understanding that we are nothing so that we come over here to Charlie Brown land, right? But in Charlie Brown land, some of us are already there. Some of us don't come over here very often. Some of us live amidst our defeats or defeats that we have created that aren't really defeats. We have created this story and this narrative that we are nothing, that people hate us, that, that everything we do is failure, that everything is broken and it doesn't matter. And we live in the midst of that. And it can be this overwhelming flood. This is, this is my area. I don't do this very often. I'm very uncomfortable when people say nice things about me because most of the time, the narrative in my head is that I am a failure over and over and over again. So this is more the area that I resonate with. This is how I wrap in on myself. And the message that I need to hear, and the message that hopefully you can hear too, is this is what makes the gospel so amazing, is that in our nothingness, we, aren't, we don't end there or stay there. In our nothingness, God chooses to love us. We are nothing, and yet to God, we are everything. God sees our nothingness. Not because it, if you really were as good as you think you are over here, then it makes sense that God would save you because you're, you're a special little snowflake. He doesn't want to see that go away. But if you really are nothing, then the good news of the gospel is even better news because you haven't done anything to earn it or deserve it, and God loves you. God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. God loves you so, so much that God refused to let you be separated even when we were running headlong into sin and division and separation, even when we are busy setting our entire world on fire around us. God says, no, I love you, and I will pour out my love over and over and over most specifically in the person of Jesus, who comes and lives, takes on our sin and dies, and is raised again, overcoming death, so that we have the opportunity, even in our nothingness, to be with God forever. This is what worship does. True worship invites us into the story. It reframes us so that we know rightly where we are, but then it says, even where you are, there is hope. And the hope is 
You don't have to live in either of these realities. Because both of these realities are curved in on themselves and bring death and agony and just pain all the way around. You don't have to live in either of these realities. You can live in the truth of God. The truth that you are nothing, but in God's eyes you are everything. Worship invites us to remember the truth, to, be, to let God sort of un, unbend us that we have come in on ourselves, and we have the opportunity to be swept up in the great story, to join in the song that God has and that worship is going on, that continues on all around us. We have the chance to be a part of it because God said, I can't imagine not having you with me. This is what worship is and what worship does. Uh, many of you know I love Eugene Peterson, who was an author and a pastor for, uh, for a long, long time. Wrote a bunch of books, was a pastor for a long time. He just recently passed away. And at his funeral, his son, as one, with one of the eulogies, stood up and he said, <clears throat> you, all, uh, have, you, all, you all got fooled. Eugene fooled you. My dad fooled you. For 39 years of public ministry, he kept writing books, he kept speaking and giving sermons, and you all thought they were all different. But he told me the secret a long time ago. He told me the secret a long time ago, and he told me that when I was even younger, when I was little, he would come in after I was asleep, and he would whisper this into my ear so that it would be woven into me. This, this secret is what every single sermon, every single book, every single talk he did was four lines. These four lines repeated over and over and over in different words. God loves you. God is on your side. He is coming for you. And he is relentless. God loves you. God is on your side. He is coming for you. And he is relentless is relentless. God loves you. God is on your side. He is coming for you. And he is relentless. This is what worship does. It speaks this truth into our lives. It invites us to let God form us and shape us out of ourselves so that we can see that even though we are nothing, in God's eyes, we are everything. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks that you invite us to join the song. We give thanks that we have the opportunity to serve and to give and to love and to pray and to sing. We give thanks, God, that you take us in our warpedness and in our brokenness and in our sin and you gently, lovingly correct us so that we aren't focused in on ourselves anymore. God, may our worship be true. May our hearts be filled with your spirit. And may we serve to and seek to transform the world, holding on to the promise of your love and the hope of your glory to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of commitment, oh, it's not a hymn this morning, it's a song of commitment. As everyone starts moving, I go, oh, where? Our song